You've called it a biography. Why? Well, I was looking for a word that was a little bit more a descriptive, a little bit more personal than history. I mean, the book was initially titled The History of Cancer, but it somehow felt that the word history was too inert uh, and I needed something more. And when I took a step back um, towards the middle of writing the book, uh, it felt as if um, I was uh, writing a portrait over time of, of something. Of course, cancer is not one disease, but many diseases. But there are deep parallels that run through these diseases. And it felt I was drawing a portrait, as I was said, and that is a biography, and so therefore I called it a biography. It, what is it about cancer that seems so human, so living? Well, part of it is that cancer uh, cells exploit um, uh, processes that are very fundamental to our lives. And by this I mean that the very genes that are altered, um, that uh, uh, unleash cancer, are genes that usually play very typical functions in our normal cells. I'll give you one example. Um, cancer cells migrate through the body, for instance, uh, a process through uh, called metastasis when they reach another site and grow. In fact, it turns out that the genes that are activated uh, as cancer cells migrate and as cancer cells set up shop in another foreign site are in fact the very genes that other cells use to migrate through the body, such as the immune system cells. Or So in other words, cancer is constantly imitating or perverting normal processes. Um, and therefore, again, it, there's a, there's a, quasi, there's a qual quality of normalcy hidden within its abnormalcy. Well, you said earlier that cancer is really a lot of different things. Is this the thing that they all have in common? No, in fact, I mean, the, the thing that they all have in common is um, cellular growth, abnormal cellular growth. That's the common feature that connects all cancers, melanoma, prostate cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that, again, is abnormal cellular growth that has been unleashed by mutating or distorting genes that control normal cellular growth. In other words, the very genes that allow your embryos to grow, that allow our brains to grow, our bodies to grow, if you distort them, if you mutate them, then you unleash abnormal growth, and that, of course, is the beginning of cancer. Well, cancer isn't just a human problem, but how old is it... Uh for humans? Is it something that's been with us since we first started uh, being hominids? Yeah. So, um, well, in fact, there have been signs of cancer found in ancient cave bears. So as you're pointing out, it's not a human problem. Um, that said, um, we the, answer is, the quick answer is we just don't know. The word cancer doesn't arise, as the book points out, as I point out in the book, the word does, cancer doesn't arise until about, uh, you know, the time of Hippocrates. Um, and so the diseases that predate that, we don't know um, whether they're cancers. But all Although said, Imhotep did describe something that we right. think was cancer. That's right. So Imhotep um, is the ancient Egyptian scribe, uh, first, written, first wrote around 2500 B.C., and has a case description that is very remarkably similar to breast cancer. Again, we don't know for sure, but the case sounds remarkably like breast cancer. But uh, I'm assuming that we, uh, in looking at old records, old uh, histories, we see things that today we say, ah, that must have been cancer. Absolutely. I mean, this. The, the, uh, I mean, I've written about that extensively in the book. In fact, you know, as you turn out through the through history, you keep on coming up with uh, these these incredible case descriptions, these riveting descriptions, which remind us that, that you know, the, the disease existed long before we could even name it. But you also say for most of history, at least until the 20th century, it seems like cancer was mostly ignored. Uh, and you write that it's often difficult to find references to cancer in literature before then. Is that because people didn't understand what it was or because cancer uh, has really become much more of a concern uh, as we have been able to live longer. Well, that's actually, that's absolutely right. That's on point. I mean, the cancer, many cancers, although not all cancers, are age-related, breast cancer and prostate cancer being two very remarkable examples of that. Um, and so, in fact, uh, cancer only appears as all other diseases are eliminated. In other words, in the 17th century, 18th century, people were dying of smallpox and cholera and tuberculosis. Um, and it's only when, when those other diseases are lifted off, it's when the veil of other illnesses is moved that you actually encounter cancer. So, and we're seeing that with Alzheimer's now. We're seeing that with many, many degenerative diseases, diseases that are related to aging ultimately, absolutely. When did the word cancer enter our vocabulary? Well, the word comes to us from the Greeks, um, has a fascinating derivation. The etymology of the word comes uh, from the fact that Hippocrates apparently um, imagined tumors as crabs, a solid tumor as a crab buried under the skin, and the blood vessels around it um, sort of spread out like the legs of the crab. So uh, it's a reminder how much of the disease is still buried in metaphor. Um, 
And you write that naming the disease uh, is often more important than describing its characteristics. Well, the naming of a disease is a very important moment because it, it allows us for the first time to discriminate that from normalcy. It is, it is a moment in time. It's sort of like, a, it's like separating the wheat from everything else. Um, and it's, a, it's by naming a disease and by putting it as a category that pathologists can begin to discover what the commonalities and differences are. And that happened in cancer around, as I said, the name is long, is, is very old, but the pathological description of cancer really comes from the 18th century.